This podcast is sponsored by Lightens. Lightens, your best source for OE quality automotive and heavy duty accessory drive tensioning devices. We know tensioners because we invented them. Roger, good morning and welcome to AMN Drive Time, sponsored by Lightens. Good morning, Bill. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me this morning. Roger, you're on the board of trustees for the University of the Aftermarket Foundation and are involved in many, many association efforts. I've heard from lots of people, of course, who speak very highly of you and your passion for volunteering and philanthropy. In fact, you are so highly regarded in this area, you were recently recognized by AWDA with the 2021 Outstanding Leader of the Year Award. Where does this passion for volunteering and advo advocacy come from? Uh, first, let me mention that Leader of the Year Award. I, I think I caught the selection committee in a lean year. You know, we were just coming out of COVID, so they may not have had a lot of uh, uh, candidates, but that was uh, that that was a wonderful thing. I was very very grateful for that. Um, I, I don't know, Bill. I don't really I don't really view my engagement in our industry as uh, as as philanthropy. Um, uh, philanthropy is what I think of when I you know give money to my church or or uh, United Way or something like that. But when I think of the industry. Uh, I really think it's a responsibility. I think that's just part of what you got to do to uh, help perpetuate the business. I, I would say I probably started uh, getting involved in association stuff uh, really more for just the networking and getting to you know be around customers and, and manufacturers that we represented. But uh, but as time goes went on, you know. Uh, I kind of got uh, drug in a little bit and uh, and understood that it was important work. And then also my my role in the company has changed since that I've got a little bit more time to devote to these kinds of uh, these kinds of things. The aftermarket foundation deal really started when uh, uh, when uh, my boss, Neil Williams, senior passed away. And uh, that was about uh, six or seven years ago. And um, we wanted to do something to honor him uh, or something in his memory. So we made a commitment to become a lifetime trustee of the, uh, uh, of the foundation. And then I represented our company as the trustee uh, to, uh, uh, to the foundation. And then a few years later, I got uh, involved in the leadership of the foundation and uh, some of the committees. But again, I, I, I see it as a responsibility. I think all of us owe something back to the business where we make our earn our livelihoods and uh, uh, you know if I can do something that uh, helps get more technicians into the uh, into the industry if I can uh, advocate uh, with uh, elected officials for some uh, uh, initiative that's important to our business then you know that's that's my that's that's part of our responsibility job Terrific. And Roger, congratulations again on receiving that Leader of the Year Award. That's a very big deal. Well, as uh, yeah, I, a, good, a close friend of, uh, of yours and mine said that same thing about 10 or 15 years ago. So, so Roger, uh, I am talking from your hometown and my hometown, Akron, Ohio. Yeah. And I think that you may be a graduate of Revere High School. Is that right? Do you come back? That. Do you come back to Akron? Do you have any haunts? Do you have any great memories in Akron growing up? Oh, well, of course. Uh, I mean, it was my hometown. I was born and raised there. I was a West Side kid and um, uh, grew up in Bath. When uh, that, That's kind of a Tony suburb now. It's, uh, it was a rural route back in when I was a kid. Uh, uh, and I went to, uh, University of Akron, um, uh, couldn't, I, I couldn't have afforded to go to school anywhere else. That was pretty much, uh, my, my only choice. Um, but yeah, uh, all of my family was there. I, I have no family left, uh, in, uh, in Akron. My folks are gone. Uh, they've passed on and, uh, uh, 
I have a, my two brothers, uh, older brothers, uh, both raised their families there, but uh, they're both uh, retired and, and living in other areas. So I don't get back uh, as much except for business. Uh, we do represent a number of companies that are in the Cleveland area, um, a couple in, in, in the Akron and Canton area. So, uh, so I enjoy coming back for that. Uh, probably come back to a, a Browns game every uh, three or four years. I can't get that out of my blood. I wish I could because it's such it's a, such a torturous fan, uh, thing to be a fan, a, a Browns fan. But uh, no, the one thing I, I, I do, Bill, is just up the street. From, I'm not sure where your office is now. I remembered when you were over on Miller Road. But uh, uh, every time I do come back, I make sure I go to Skyway and, uh, and get a, uh, a hamburger and onion rings in California. And, uh, uh, but, uh, no, great, great place to grow up. Great place to be, uh, from I've actually lived in Atlanta now longer than I ever lived in Akron. I, I was there till I was 29 and then I've been, uh, in, uh, in Atlanta ever since. And that's a longer period than 29 years. I won't go into more detail than that. For the benefit of the AMN audience in Akron, Ohio, there are two, which we consider to be famous drive-in cheeseburger, cheeseburger places where you pull your car in and they come out and serve you. One is called yeah. Skyway, the other is called Swenson's, and it's a little bit like being a Cubs fan or a White Sox fan in Chicago. You have a favorite, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. yeah I'm, a, I'm a Skyway fan all in. I mean, I, that's a course where, um, also where during high school on, you know, every Friday night we take our hot rod cars and, and drive around the Skyway parking lot and uh, occasionally, Bill, uh, if you can think of how little traffic there was, we'd take Miller Road all the way down to 71, park our cars on the freeway, and then drag race uh, about a mile or half a mile up the road and never pass a car. <laughs> and a car would never pass us. So pretty safe uh, uh, street racing, I guess you'd say, back in those days. But, uh, but yeah, I've been a, a, a car guy all my life. So Roger uh, grew up in Akron and walk us through how you got started in the industry. I, I think was your first job with Ken Tool or? or... So my first job was at a, a, a parts store in, in Akron that my dad managed. And uh, I worked there you know, just as a kid through school and, uh, uh, and during, during the time that I went to college at, at Akron University. And then, uh, uh, Afterwards, uh, I, I had no aspiration to be in the parts business per se. I mean, I like cars, but I really didn't uh, I didn't imagine myself getting involved in the automotive aftermarket. Uh, I didn't really understand much about it, much about the industry, other than that, <clears throat> you know, our store bought parts and sold them to, to shops. And but I did do every job from driving a delivery truck to working behind the counter to putting up stock, and uh, uh, really a tremendous lesson and and i'd encourage anybody getting into the auto parts business to spend a, a six months or a year behind the counter doing or doing something in the store because it's the best education that i ever got um uh, when nobody came calling to hire roger mccullum when i graduated from uh, akron u uh except for a guy named scott meyer that you may know bill he uh uh ran ken tool he was the at the time he was the sales manager of ken tool and he hired me as kind of to carry his briefcase or be his assistant. Um, and uh, I needed a job. I was getting married in a couple of months and uh, it, uh, it, it turned out great. I fell in love with the business. I, I went to my first AWDA meeting, I mean, six months out of college. So it was, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a heck of an education at an early age and I got a lot of terrific exposure. So that's how I got started. I worked at Ken Tool for six years. N.A. Williams Company was our manufacturer's rep in the Southeast. That was the part of the country that we covered uh, at the time. And um, uh, I was terribly impressed with Neil Williams as, as, uh, as most of us that knew him were. And uh, no one had offered me a job in like the whole six years I was at Ken Tool until uh, uh, Neil did and Napa did right at the same time. <laughs> and uh, uh, Napa, somebody was leaving and I was doing a lot of work with them. That was our biggest customer. And so some way, one way or the other, I was going to end up in Atlanta. 
And, uh, and uh, I kind of flipped a coin and thought that it might be more fun learning about the rep business, at least be a lot of, a lot of variety. And, uh, and that was 30, 38 years ago that I came to, uh, came to Atlanta and went to work at Annie Williams Company. I do know Scott Meyer, and I believe he was a graduate of the University of Akron as well. He was. He was. In fact, uh, he, he found my resume in the uh, placement office when he was looking to hire somebody. Um, his uh, wife, Kathy, uh, if I'm, I think I'm right about this, was a sorority sister of my sister-in-law. So uh, my brother's wife. So, I mean, there's somehow there was a connection there, small world type thing, but Akron's not a big place, <laughs> really. It may be now, it wasn't then. But uh, yeah, that's how I, how I came to work for Scott and uh, really enjoyed it. And he and I have been lifelong friends. As you've gone through the automotive aftermarket, talk to me about some of your top influences or mentors. I suspect you've had a number of folks who have had a, a influence on you and your career in the aftermarket. Yeah, as I, as I, I really have, and, and I've been incredibly fortunate um, to, uh, you know, to be around some, some really brilliant people. Uh, I'll tell you the, 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 the one thing with me though, that uh, I think helped me in those early years is I learned, uh, I learned how to be humble and in my case, I had a lot to be humble about. <laughs> so uh, my best, and, and it was really my most successful sales technique was to just be, look, I'm just a young kid that doesn't know anything and I'm looking for a break. And I found that older people like to help younger people. And it's just a natural part of life. So when I was at Kentool, particularly getting started, um, I really didn't know anything. But I had to represent my company, and um, uh, so customers, guys like Aaron Berkowitz from Eastern Tool Warehouse, one of my earliest uh, mentors, just a ter terrific, brilliant guy. Um, uh, Bob McKenna at Napa was was very much a a, a mentor to me and somebody I, I looked up to. Uh, Bob Susser from Napa Auto Parts in those days. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I got a chance to, uh, to meet a lot of important people. I remember one guy really made a, uh, he would have never remembered me much, but uh, his name was Dunbar Abston, and he was the uh, president of Parts Incorporated. And he has passed on uh, a number of years ago, uh, but this would have been in the late 70s, early 80s, and I was having to manage an AWDA meeting on Kentool and why Dunbar came to the Kentool meeting is beyond me because it <laughs> must have been shorthanded. But he came in there and equipped with uh, uh, some numbers and he explained to me what uh, Gimroy was. And I know this sounds silly. Uh, I was a graduate of Akron's business school and I <laughs> never heard of gross margin return on investment. But uh, he essentially sat there and said, we're not making enough money on your product line. So you either have to raise your prices. Back in those days, it was up to us to raise the prices. Um, or you need to take back some inventory or you need to, you need to sell it faster or, or turn it. And, 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 and I worked through the equation and I learned a really important lesson. And that was that if you understand how your customer makes money, you can sell them. And up to that point, I was always talking about how great our tools were or how great uh, or the features and benefits or that type of thing. Ultimately, nobody cares about that. They, you got to you got to know how you can make money. I had a customer tell me one time that he hated Ken tool because the stuff was so damn heavy that it cost him a fortune to ship it every time he had to ship it to a customer. So I learned that, too, that. But understanding how customers make money was one of the most important lessons that I that I ever had. And uh, in terms of mentors, there were so many more. I will say one thing that that uh, later in his life, because I didn't know him early in his life, but uh, Jack Kramer became a, uh, a a real mentor to me. And it was after he was retired, and uh, well, he never really retired, but 
Um, I talked to him on the phone about, you know, once or twice a week, uh, always at the same time, about 5.30 Eastern time. He'd, uh, right before his cocktail hour, I think, he'd call me at the office and uh, knew that things were slowing down a little bit and, uh, and uh, helped me a great deal. Roger, uh, have there been any game-changing moments in your career that stood out? Any flashpoints for you? Well, I think I, I, I think that not, not so much um, uh, personally or in, individually, uh, but, but I just think some of the some of the real transitions that occurred in uh, uh, in 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 business and the approach to business. I mean, I started in the traditional side of the business. Retailers weren't even thought of in that in that time. Uh, but, uh, I remember when, uh, uh, a company called, uh, Atlantic and Pacific, uh, got started in Memphis and they were selling, uh, to independent divers all over the country at, at really discounted prices. And another company popped up also in Memphis called prime automotive and the, the big WDs, uh, you know, it, it, they were just incensed by this because it was hurting their margins and taking away some some uh, uh, business from uh, uh, from them. Uh, uh, I can remember Joe Owen from CarQuest telling me one time that uh, uh, you know they're just takers; they're not giving back to the industry. They're not uh, they're not as engaged and what have you. Well, the truth was, the lesson I learned from that is that the uh, the uh, the, the customer or the stores in this, in this instance are always going to find the most efficient way to buy a product. And then fast forward a few more years and AutoZone gets started. And all I heard from the same people at NAP and the WDs and what have you is they, 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 they didn't sell quality uh, product or it wasn't as good as someplace else. Um, and over time, that transitioned, and, and it was kind of the same argument from the A&P thing, and then it was the retailers, and then it was the Internet. And it's true that, <clears throat> that uh, you know, manufacturers have to, have to select the, uh, their customers carefully, and they have to do what they have to support their existing customers. But ultimately, um, as I said, ultimately the consumer is going to find the, uh, whether it's the DIY or, or do it for me, is going to find the most efficient way to, to get their product. Roger, as chairman and CEO of N.A. Williams, you are in the business, of course, of representing brands. How, in your opinion, Roger, has the value of brands changed over the years? And what are some of the influences that have changed the way we see brands today? And along those same lines, whether it's a 100-year-old brand or a startup, what are some of the things that uh, makes, a, makes a brand one that you can believe in? A lot of pieces, parts to that, but I think you get the drift of what we're talking about. Yeah, I, I do. Um, uh, you know, brands are, as in, I think, are as important today as, as they have ever been. Uh, I, I, I think that a, a you know, I mean, a brand is, you know, all of us have our own personal brands. Our, uh, we, our companies have a, have a brand, have an image. Uh, uh, Babcock certainly has as, as, uh, has, has a, as important brand attributes as, uh, as any of the national brands that are sold in, in, in parts stores. Uh, you have to polish that brand all the time. You have to make sure that the image that you're upholding um, speaks to what the expectations are of the customers. When that deteriorates, it, it's tough to get it back. And I, and I think of, uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to use examples, but, but big national brands that have uh, maybe in an effort to uh, save money, uh, have uh, let their product quality deteriorate a little bit, and all it takes is a customer one time just to have a bad experience and that brand that spent 75 years or something trying to build itself up is out as far as that guy goes. 
happens every day to all of us in some in some some fashion. But uh, uh, I mentioned in my previous remark that uh, manufacturers have to select their customers wisely. They have to uh, treat all of their customers with integrity, and 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 they have to remain competitive. And they also have to accept that their customers have their own brands, whether it's you know Napa, which is both a brand and shop, um, uh, Advanced Auto Parts with their brands that they brought to the market, and then when they acquired CarQuest, CarQuest was a wonderful brand and still is, and they're starting to bring that back into their, uh, or they have brought it back into their stores in the in the advanced stores. Uh, but I think that that you know when we speak of brands, often in our company or in our, in our industry, we're thinking of a national brand like a Monroe or a Tenneco or something, versus a house brand like a Duralast or a Napa or whatever. All are important. All are all have quality products in the box, um, but there but there's a place for everybody to uh, to exist. One of the things you got to be, you know, again, I said the customer is always going to find the most efficient way. You still have to be careful that uh, that you don't damage your brand uh, selling it to, uh, uh, to 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 channels that may erode some of that image that you're that you're trying to protect. So it's a it's a tightrope, but it's it's important and, and critically so, I think. So I'm hearing. Part of what I'm hearing, I think, Roger, is brands can be fragile. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just like just like reputations can be fragile. You can uh, you can build, you can spend your entire career, uh, and uh, and lose it all in 15 minutes if uh, if you if you do something the wrong way. Um, uh, you know, there's. There, what, what, what Joe Owen uh, would always tell me, uh, there's no uh, right way to do the wrong thing. So, uh, you know, reputation and integrity, um, and I don't mean that in a pious way at all. I mean, I, I'm just saying a, a, a person's, a, a salesperson, a, a brand, a company, um, a distributor, you know, you got to do things the right way. You gotta, you gotta let the other guy make a little money on on occasion, uh, and uh, and when all parties uh, can walk away and say, okay, I'm I'm okay with this. I can I can live with it. It's good. You don't have to say, man, we beat that guy, and I really got a big deal. You just have to say, okay, we're gonna make some money. He's gonna make some money, uh, and uh, and we're selling a good product that that can be uh, that you know that that deserves a, a, a fine, a solid reputation. So Roger, in your career, I'm sure you've had a lot of, uh, a lot of travel, a lot of trips, a lot of trade shows, a lot of dinners. Any favorite memories from the road or industry event that stand out, that, uh, that bring a smile to your face as you think back? Well, my goodness, uh, we've, one of the great things about traveling and, and, and traveling for business is you get to have dinner in some of the best restaurants in the country. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and do so with uh, some really great people. Uh, I've had wonderful dinners, wonderful events. Most of you know, some of the things that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the funny things or, or the, the things that you remember, uh, I just assume not mentioned here on uh, AMN Drive Time. Uh, I will tell you a funny story, just as the, just as a, a young salesman, a traveling story that has, you know, no 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 meaning at this point in time. But I was, had just joined NA Williams. I was probably there about a year, and I got sent to, uh, if I remember correctly, Norfolk, Virginia, and. There was a, a chain of stores there called Twin B Auto Parts. They don't exist anymore. I don't, they sold to somebody, maybe Advance or something, years and years ago. But we represented Deco at the time, and we were going to convert them from whatever their belt line was uh, to Deco. And it might have been a, a, a it might have been a retail brand of Deco's, uh, Drive Right or Drive Tech or something. But regardless, 
Um, I get up there on a Sunday night and I go to the rental car place. I, I've got 10 stores that I've got to convert in five days. And when you're, when you're uh, a belt salesman, you're really a carpenter because all you're doing is hanging the, the you had to build new racks and everything and put it all together. So I show up, I've got my bag of tools, I'm ready to go. I go to rent my car and the guy says, Mr. McCollum. I, I was looking around to see if my dad was behind me because I was a kid. He said, your driver's license is expired. <clears throat> and I said, hey, thanks for telling me. I'll get that renewed when I get back to Atlanta. He says, now you don't understand. I'm not going to rent you a car. And I immediately realized I'm going to get fired tomorrow. I, I, I mean, I, I've got to get this job done. So I take a shuttle to the hotel and I'm up half the night, but it finally hit me. I'm just going to go get a Virginia driver's license first thing in the morning. So I took a taxi to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, took the written test, passed it. <clears throat> I cheated. I used, you know, open book test. But, um, and then I go up to the, uh, the officer, a uh, little woman I remember is probably 65, 70 years old, about four foot 11, uh, Inspector Callahan or something. And I said, uh, hey, I'm ready to take the driver's test. And she goes, well, just bring your car around front and I'll ride with you. And I said, well, I don't have a car, you know, I'm going to use your car. She said, no, you can't use my car. So I called the rental company. No, we're not giving you your car either until you have a driver's license. So I called this uh, driving academy that was, you know, like Sears driving school or something. And a guy uh, answers the phone. He says, well, all our, all our instructors are out right now um, with, with, with uh, students. But, you know, I've got a car and I could come by and, you know, maybe help you and I said, well, what are you thinking? And he said, I'm thinking hundred dollars. And I said, I'm thinking $50. <laughs> he said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. And a nasty old Datsun 280Z with, uh, you know, tailpipe dragging on the back, uh, shows up, stick shift. Fortunately, I knew how to drive one. Uh, I hopped in, took my driving test, got my Virginia driver's license, rented a car and uh, finished all 10 stores that week. Um, and, uh, I think that was the most resourceful thing I've ever done before or since. That's a terrific story, Roger. <laughs> Absolutely true, Bill. Absolutely true. Roger, everybody, of course, is familiar with N.A. Williams and, and you, of course, but could you just walk us through the, the growth of N.A. Williams over the years? Because you guys have had quite a success story. And I think we'd all love to hear of what's the magic. Bill, there, the, <clears throat> it's, it's, the magic is hard work, but it's, it's, really, not ma uh, it's really not magic. It is, it is a, a theory that, that, we, uh, that I learned from Neil Williams, and I've tried to practice during my career, and our new generation of leaders that, 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 are, that are taking over the, the company now uh, also uh, – uh, part of the Williams family. I mean, we actually have four generations of, of Williams that have been involved in this business. And my role as, as coming in and, and helping lead the company really was because I was, I was about 19 years younger than Neil Williams. And I was about, and I am about uh, 16 years older than, uh, than uh, Chris Williams. And, uh, and maybe about six or seven years older than uh, Neil Williams Jr. And there's another brother that's, uh, that's a partner in the business, Ridley Williams. So I was a, I was a, a bridge, if you will, uh, between generations. But our, 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 uh, our foundation has always been hire really good people, pay them as much as you can afford to pay them, support them and get the hell out of their way and let them do their job. So that that really is the foundation. Now, beyond that, we've been successful in, in uh, accelerating our growth uh, through some acquisitions. We never really, uh, we never really had uh, a, a, a goal to become a national company, although we, we pretty much are now. But, uh, but defensively, we, we didn't want to, uh, we saw a lot of reps who would lose a big customer because AutoZone bought uh, 
cheap auto parts or an O'Reilly bought Hilo or whatever the, uh, or maybe it's the other way around, it's been so long ago. But, but we didn't want that to happen to us. So when, uh, when O'Reilly started moving into the Southeast and buying big warehouse distributors, we acquired a rep agency in the Midwest and were able to open an office and do business in Springfield. And, uh, and we always have good competition. Uh, it just gives us a little jump and a head start. We, we had an opportunity to get into the heavy duty business. We knew we couldn't get our auto parts guys calling on heavy duty, so we bought a rep agency that specialized in that. Now that's about 12, 13% of our total business is, is in the heavy duty space. Uh, we, uh, uh, we've, we've grown geographically to expand our footprint. Uh, we've bought some, uh, or we recently uh, uh, got engaged uh, with another rep firm that is in, in another uh, industry uh, from, uh, uh, from automotive. So it gives us a little bit of a different perspective. And, uh, and through all of that, we, we added scale. And as we added scale, we were able to add services. Uh, you know, when you can be the best salesman in the world, but if you're a one person rep, uh, you just can't go to every uh, job or store and try to teach them something or call on them or do a change of, you just don't have the resources. So we've been able to really focus on analytics uh, which is terribly important in, in all industries today. Uh, and, uh, and, and each of our offices has its own analyst. We have an office in, for all of the major customers, has an own analyst exclusive for the, that team. Uh, also, our, all of our major accounts have exclusive sales teams. Uh, we we uh, recently hired a guy that comes from uh, 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 channel partners and has a background not in automotive but in uh, assisting uh, third-party providers with e-commerce solutions so it, all of these things have added and and helped us accelerate uh, our uh, uh, our growth a good bit and the purpose of that growth honestly if you just keep the perspective is to better serve our manufacturers who pay us and better serve our customers who buy the goods that we represent. And if we can, uh, if we can keep those two parties uh, happy uh, and, and add services to add value to our, uh, to our offering, then that's, that's the magic, that's the success. Roger, one last question for you. What would the AMN audience be surprised to learn about Roger? Uh, gosh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty transparent, Bill. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that there's much, um, you know, I, I am, uh, uh, I love, I love cars. I, uh, I've actually tried, uh, going to, you know, driving schools and things like that. I had, I had in my mind that I was going to be, I was going to, uh, buy one of those spec Miatas and, and get a sports car club of America license and, and uh, go out and try to drive. And I, uh, <clears throat> and I felt pretty, you know, when, when you take these driving schools, uh, and I've done a couple with, uh, with Porsche of North America and, and the, the skip Barbary type schools, what, what you, uh, what you find is you think, man, I am so good. I can do this. I'm fast. I got the corners right. I know how to apex and all this stuff. And then before you go home, you get to, you take a hot lap with a professional driver and you realize it's just like playing golf with Tiger Woods, man. <laughs> you know, you're just not that good. So I have put that uh, out of my mind, although I, I still uh, enjoy playing around like that. Roger, it's been great to be with you today on AMN Drive Time, sponsored by Lightens. Thank you, Bill. I enjoyed it. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to, to visit with you. This podcast is sponsored by Lightens. Lightens, your best source for OE quality automotive and heavy duty accessory drive tensioning devices. We know tensioners because we invented them.